diplomat in residence here at the University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor. I, one thing I often uh, try to explain to people is how did I happen to wind up here in Ann Arbor. Uh, basically, the concept is that the, I'm a Foreign Service officer. I'm actually an employee of the Department of State. I've been doing this for about 20, a little over 26 years. And every year, uh, the Department of State assigns 16 of us to different regions of the United States in order to serve as diplomats and residents, just to kind of um, explain uh, a little bit about the work of the Department of State and uh, try to try to engage with people who might be interested in, in connecting up somehow with that work. Um, that work, you know, you know, broadly defined, is uh, sometimes is summarized as serving the interests and the aspirations of the American people. Interests, we sometimes think of things like economic well-being, security, and so on. Aspirations are things that are a little bit more aspirational in nature by the, the word. And for example, uh, the Secretary has recently described, uh, for example, the status of women and girls around the world as the unfinished business of the 21st century, and that's something that we're involved with uh, very deeply. So, uh, and uh, I have an office here at the Ford School up on the fifth floor. I'm always happy to talk to people individually. Just to kind of give a heads up, this period between now and about November 2nd is quite hectic for me. In addition to being responsible for the University of Michigan, I'm also responsible for all the other colleges and universities in Michigan, plus all the colleges and universities in Ohio, plus all of those in Kentucky. So this involves me, especially this time of year, usually in uh, September and October, I do quite a bit of traveling around to some of those campuses. So the uh, best way is I have my cards here if you want to get a hold of me. Generally speaking, uh, you know, beyond my tenure here, this is kind of the go-to website uh, for opportunities with the Department of State, careers.state.gov. The kind of basic concept there you've seen is a couple of key items there. Uh, I'll highlight is the one that says learn. You can learn about the various opportunities that we have, and there are little drop downs that you can find out about that, someone about our background, and so on. Engaging, there's actually, we have forums. We actually have people, if you have any, ever have any questions, there's about nine different forums you can go on there. There are people actually paid to get an answer to your question within about 48 hours. And also, just if you're ever uh, trying to find me or any other diplomats and residents, you can do that by using this map and so on to find us. Um, so I, I, kind of a, a rather broad set of topics today, I'd just like to quickly, uh, uh, first of all, make sure I know who I'm talking to. How many freshmen are here? Any freshmen? Okay, good. Excellent. Okay. And uh, sophomores? Okay, good. And juniors? And seniors? Okay. And uh, graduate students? Okay, so we're going to all over the place. Okay, that's fine. We actually, um, if it's, uh, one, if you notice up on the top of this webpage, it's kind of a crucial uh, element there. It says, keep me informed. This is a, um, an email service that we have, and this is critically important. If you're interested in any of the opportunities I'm talking about tonight, to, to sign up for these email alerts. Because many times, um, there are opportunities that come along, and unless you... Uh, you know, catch the train when it goes by. Uh, it's, they're only open usually for about two weeks or a month. Uh, a couple of announcements came out today about some job opportunities, for example. For the freshmen here, for example, there's actually uh, an opportunity that you're, is available to people in something called the Virtual Student Foreign Service. This is an uh, opportunity where you link up either to an office in Washington or to an embassy overseas, and you kind of basically are working with them throughout the course of the whole school, school year while staying here in Ann Arbor. And uh, so, for example, I have a student from Ohio University who's working for about three or four hours every week. Uh, but again, that announcement came out in July. So unless you saw that on my Facebook page or you subscribe to these alerts, you're going to miss that kind of thing. Just to explain how that's done, if you click on that Keep Me Informed, um, it, a little, you give us your email address. And I hope I can find this here. So you give us your email address and you, you can assign a password and it's not a bad idea to periodically go back and check your settings. And the reason it's important to check your settings once in a while is that um, this is what we call an opt-in system. And, you know, if you're familiar with the, bless you, if you're uh, familiar with the concept of opting in, that means that people don't want to spam you, they only want to send you the information you specifically request. 
I personally kind of find this irritating because I've asked for everything. But, and you can see I've kind of checked every single box. But every once in a while, uh, they will add a new box. Now, some of the ones that are as you as students, uh, just to explain here what the kinds of boxes you have. You have the civil service, the foreign service officer grouping, the foreign service specialist grouping, uh, and so on, so on, so on, all the various specialty jobs, which are about 21 or so. Opportunities in Afghanistan and Iraq, professional fellowships. Finally, you get down to student programs. And uh, for example, this, under student programs there, you'll notice the second one says here, Pathways Internship Program. That just was added fairly recently. I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit more about this later. Today, we're going to be talking quite a bit about this uh, number one, two, three, four, five here, the US Department of State Student Experience. And then there's the one I just mentioned, the Virtual Student Foreign Service. Uh, so again, if, you're, if any of those things you know, seem of interest, and you want to make sure you sign on for these. As I say, the virtual student foreign service that came out, the announcement was in July, and people had about two weeks to get in their application. Um, I'd like to kind of, so again, so just to recap, that careers.state.gov and, and the keep me informed is critically important. I did want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we get involved with it in terms of, again, the topic tonight being uh, fellowships, internships, and career opportunities. So it's kind of a, uh, we're going to basic plan in the next half an hour or so is to kind of cover all that, that all those topics a little, and just kind of skim over the surface. And then if people want to follow up with me in more detail, they can. For example, has anybody here heard of something known as the Critical Language Scholarship Program? Okay, I'm seeing a few hands go up here. Basically, you can see here, this is a program the Department of State is very involved with. The idea is to, to encourage the study of the languages you see listed here, Arabic, Azerbaijani, Bangla, or Bengali, Chinese, Hindi, Indonesian, Japanese, Korean, Persian, Punjabi, Russian, Turkish, and Urdu. So this is a chance for you uh, to actually, it's a very good program. Is anybody planning to apply for that? Arabic. What language? Uh, Arabic. Okay. Any other languages? Chinese. Chinese? And yourself? Anyone? Arabic. Arabic? Okay. Any Indonesian ones here? I, I worked in Indonesia. I'm always partial to Indonesia. Okay, so again, that's something we get uh, in, uh, that you know the Department of State is involved with. And again, you kind of think back. This is what I said was about the work of the Department of State. The idea being that you know it's an aspiration of ours. I think and we also actually think it's in our interest to have people uh, get to know the languages of, of countries that we're not as familiar with. Has anybody heard of this scholarship, the Boron Scholarship? Okay, good. We have a couple, the Boron Scholarship does a really good job. They have a representative both for the scholarship and the fellowship. In this particular case, uh, this again provides a chance to do language studies named after a famous uh, or well-known senator from Oklahoma, David Boron. Uh, and this particular one also involves, if you do this program, then you there's a work commitment that you're willing to work for the U.S. government, include, perhaps with the Department of State or the Department of Defense. Um, or other national security agency for at least a year after you return. Great program. So again, these are all things that we are sort of involved with. Um, another one that uh, I'm going to be doing is another program. Uh, there's two fellowships that are available for people who are interested in a career, basically doing what I do as a foreign service officer. Uh, this program is available either for someone who is a junior who, uh, who at that point in their life says, yeah, I think I'd like to be a foreign service officer. You can apply for this uh, scholarship. It pays for uh, your senior year in college, $40,000, plus $40,000 for your first year of a master's program. Two paid internships, one in Washington on Capitol Hill, one overseas. This is named after a congressperson. And then uh, we have an agreement uh, with um, a bunch, I, I'm sorry, excuse me, I, I take it back. I'm sorry, I misspoke here. The, uh, the, the Rango program for juniors is slightly different. The Rango program uh, provides, a, it's a six week experience on Capitol Hill for juniors. For seniors, the Rango program uh, provides, it pays for two years of a master's degree. And again, with a paid internship on Capitol Hill and a paid internship overseas, the second one. In return, the person who gets the scholarship has to agree to serve as a foreign service officer for at least three years. Uh, the, uh, the reason I misspoke is I have another program on my mind is that one named after not a congressperson, but a famous <coughs> diplomat. He's been in the news the last few days because he's named as the head of the um, Accountability Review Board for the events in Benghazi, Thomas Pickering. And this scholarship is the same thing, uh, basically, uh, for seniors. 
It um, pays, again, for the two years, $40,000 a year for two years uh, of a master's degree, two paid internships, in this case, one with the Department of State in Washington and one overseas. And in return, uh, the person who receives it has to be uh, willing to, uh, to uh, serve in the Foreign Service for, for at least three years. Uh, there will be a representative of the Pickering Foundation that's going to be coming out here to, uh, to Michigan in late October, and he'll be doing a program just especially on that particular fellowship. Um, for juniors, there's also a variant of this program for juniors. This is what I kind of started to describe earlier. Is a junior, again, would pay for $40,000 for your senior year, $40,000 for the first year of the master's program, the two internships, and then we have an agreement with 20 leading schools that they will pick up the second year master's degree. And again, the service commitment is to serve at least for, um, for three years as a public service officer. So again, just these are some of the, as I say, some of the things that the Department of State are in the area of language studies or either in promoting interest in a career in the Foreign Service that we that are available to you. I also want to talk a little bit, you know, in a little bit, um, kind of moving, if I could, quickly to the idea of careers. Um, has anybody here ever been on a website known as USAJobs.gov? Okay. So a lot of people who go there have uh, expressed frustration, and the primary frustration they do as college students is looking at a typical announcement, it'll say, oh, it's a nine level job, you need to have such and such a degree, but you, and then it goes on to add, you need, um, you need to have one year of experience at the seven level, which is like the next level down. This, and this is, you've been a student, where are you supposed to get this one year of experience? So the, people, the frustration I hear from people is that, uh, is that you know, it's very difficult to break in. So this frustration on your part has been heard by the federal government, and there's a, a new pro program that's been announced called Pathways. Has anybody heard this term? So just to kind of root, for those who haven't heard of it, basically Pathways is a federal-wide brand or program that applies to all uh, federal agencies. And uh, the way what's happened is that it was officially announced uh, in the beginning of July. And the federal government, working the way it does, is that each unit of the federal government is given six months to get with the program and uh, to come up with their version of that. Now, some uh, parts of the federal government have been a little uh, faster off the dime than the others. I understand the Department of Treasury has already announced theirs. Uh, and if you look on uh, search for pathways on USA Jobs, you'll see that NASA has already announced its version for incoming engineers for, for NASA. The big difference of this program is that it will focus not on your previous work experience, but your, your experience. Uh, now and again, uh, this is going also going to be, in that, the Department of State will be announcing theirs in the next month or so. So if you're interested, this is particularly for the seniors, those who are kind of thinking, or ready to get out in the workforce. What you want to do is again, go back to that keep me informed section and sign up. Remember that the check boxes were there. One was for a pathways internship program. There's going to be another program in our version of it that's going to be called the Pathways Recent Graduate Program. So the difference, as I understand it, you have to kind of re-see the announcement when it comes out, the difference is going to be that the, um, the internship is a little bit more bridging from, uh, from your role as a student into the workforce, whereas the recent graduate you can apply for within a two-year period. Are you shaking your head? Or is it? Okay. I know one of the people on there. Oh, you know one of the people yeah. Oh, you know Katie or Marissa? Daniel. Oh, you know Daniel? Okay. Okay. Uh, you know Danielle Fultz? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Daniel Howell from Oh, okay. I'm sorry. This is, I'm sorry. Okay. Someone we got onto my Facebook page. Okay. Um, so anyway, so this is a, a kind of a. Uh, I'm sorry. I, don't, I will have more. I hope to have more details on that. But again, it's the kind of thing. Is again, you wanted to go here. And under student programs here, you see where it says uh, Pathways Internship Program. But the thing you need to be a little careful for, as I say, this is an opt-in system. And my friends back in Washington may add a little new box down there, like Pathways Recent Graduate Program or something else. So you want to you know, go back and check your settings. You know, not compulsively, but you know, every once in a while. OK, um, let's see where we're at here. And any questions so far? Can't have been that clear. I mean, seriously? 
Any, yes? Good, exactly, this is a very good question. Now the key word here is, and you know, I handed you out this nice brochure, and the fact is that that brochure is now out of date because of this development. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the entire federal government is gonna adapt a policy where, whereby the word internship uh, is reserved for situations where you actually are paid money. Whereas the, the, the program that is the one that you ha is in this brochure is an unpaid internship. So, we're, so we had to come up with a new brand for this. So they've come out with a new brochure, which again, you can, law, you can rather than destroy several forests and, you know, and so this is what the brochure now looks like. As you can see here, it's now been rebranded as a student experience program. So basically, uh, you know, that's, that's it's this, the, the content of the brochure is very similar, uh, but that's the, that's the one difference is it's even rebranded. So, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, is the Pathways program for recent graduates a paid experience done? I'm sorry? Is the Pathways for recent graduates paid done or unpaid? Yeah, so again, the word, as I understand it, from now on, the word internship, as it, when it ever comes, has to do anything with the federal government, will involve being paid. And something else will be, so you don't have to like read the fine print, so you, in terms of you, you know it's either an internship would be paid. That's my understanding. I, you can just check that out. Um, it, it, earlier on, we were, some, we, I do want to spend a little bit, if it's so, any other questions before I go on? Yeah. I, I, you, you, again, these are run by the Woodrow Wilson organization, so again, it, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Pickering is going to come out and he can talk a little bit more about that in, in detail. They're kind of about 20 of the leading schools, one of them being the University of Michigan Ford School, and sort of ones, you know, the ones you might think of, Georgetown, Columbia, you know, and several others. Yeah? What is the, na what is the difference between a uh, scholarship and a fellowship? Uh, good question. Which one? It, there's basically no difference as far as I know. I is, it, is it the Wrangell Fellowship or the Wrangell? I think it's called a fellowship as far as I know. It, yeah, it, yeah, it's a fellowship worth $40,000 a year. So, Okay, um, the other thing, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, a program that is available that people might think of as an option for this coming summer. And you might ask, well, gosh, why? It's like October 1, why am I talking about this program? The reason I'm talking about this program now is that the deadline to apply for this program is November 2nd. You don't have to commit to it now, you know, but it, you, and, and I encourage people to think, you know, to, if they're thinking about what they're doing next summer, to think about more than one option. And, but if you want to have this be an option, you need to get an application in by November 2nd at 11.59 p.m. Uh, and this is this thing we're now calling it uh, the Student Experience Program. And if you visit my Facebook page, actually I'm very proud of the fact we've had about 50 people from the three states that I cover, uh, Kentucky, Ohio, and Michigan, have been, uh, stay here, have, have done these, uh, this program, this, what we're now calling a Student Experience Program. So Curtis Chan here, Curtis is from um, Ohio State. And uh, he's been uh, working in, wa he was working in Washington this uh, last summer. Um, and in his case, kind of interesting how it worked out. He was getting near the completion of his studies and they liked him so much there that they actually agreed he stayed on as a, what we call a contractor. In addition to the full-time employees at the Department of State, we hire many, many different contracting organizations. So Curtis, in this case, has kind of morphed into uh, an opportunity to, you know, he's actually working, and so I was asking him, I said, Curtis, well, I was working out with your degree, and he, so he somehow has worked it out with his home university, he's only got a couple of courses left, so he decided this opportunity came along, he was going to go with it. You can't, it's kind of hard to explain how this works, but basically people kind of go back to, the, to Washington, they get involved 
you know, making themselves indispensable, basically, and then just one thing led to another. So the kind of the networking opportunities that are available to you in Washington, it's not a guarantee, but they often can lead to something. And another interesting case, a student I was talking to just uh, last week from Ohio State, he is kind of an ex he's very interested in arms control. So he was back working in this unit, arms control unit of the Department of State, and so happens he's a historian. He's studying history at OSU. And um, anyway, they were working along over the summer, and then somebody pipes up, oh gosh, you know, wouldn't it be neat? You know, we got all these people who are about to retire who've been doing like arms control for the last 40 years. Wouldn't it be neat if we uh, could do some sort of oral history program, you know, that we could, you know, capture the experience of these people. And everybody's going to sit around the office scratching their heads saying, hey, gosh, you know, I wish we knew a historian. So again, this uh, Matthew pipes up and says, oh gosh, well, I'm a historian, you know, I could do this. And so again, this has kind of morphed into a situation where he's now uh, gotten involved. And again, it's probably the last thing that would have come to my mind that the arms control people needed a historian. But again, you sh it's one of these cases that you kind of are in the right place at the right time. Some of the other people here, Mary. Mary is a, a, a law student here at the University of Michigan. Uh, she was in the Congo. Danielle is from uh, Ohio University. She was in Ottawa. Katie. Uh, also from Ohio, she was working in um, Mexico City. Uh, Marissa is a graduate student here at the Ford School. She was also happened to be in Mexico City, and so on and so on. If you keep reading, there's just some more examples of what these people. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how did this work out that uh, that all these people wound up in these different places? And basically, the way it worked out was that we kind of made a decision that rather than have uh, some central off person in Washington make the decision as to where a particular student should go, uh, we would leave that decision up to the people who expressed an interest or applied for the program. And the way that's done, if you've read through the brochure, is, in, is that you express an interest in a primary and a secondary um, choice. And you have to know a little bit about, in order to do this, you have to kind of know a little bit about how the Department of State is structured. The department is, you know, as it's indicated, the Department of State is a big unit and it consists of subunits known as bureaus. Some of those bureaus are geographic in nature. So if you, if any of you picked up this little chart here, you kind of look down the chart here and it kind of, this is one thing, this is, um, this is actually, this is a page from the new brochure, by the way. Um, so it, it's slightly different from the chart in your, in your book. So you can see here there's a Bureau of Administration. But if you go down there, you can sort of tick off the ones that are geographic in nature. First one up, the second one on the list, African Affairs, that's geographic in nature. Uh, next you get East Asian and Pacific Affairs, European and Eurasian Affairs. Down to the ends, you get Near East Asian Affairs. Another one under S, uh, I believe, I thought it was there. South okay. Central Asian. South Central, is that somewhere there? Yeah, South Central Asian Affairs, right after population, refugees, migration. And then finally, the last one, Western Hemisphere Affairs. Now, if I said all those names, I think most of you kind of off the top of your ma mind could kind of get a picture in your mind, well, what would be Western Hemisphere Affairs? That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> East Asian Pacific, that makes quite a, it's pretty obvious. European and Eurasian Affairs and African Affairs. Those are all you can probably imagine. There's a few unusual ones. For example, there's an, anybody ever heard of the island nation of Mauritius? It's out in the middle of the, yes, okay. So we had a student from uh, Adrian College who spent uh, 10 weeks this summer out on the island nation of Mauritius. So happens by some quirk of fate that Mauritius is included in the Bureau of African Affairs. It has to be somewhere, so they put it in there. The two that are a little kind of slightly counterintuitive is there's one, <coughs> the South Central Asian Affairs if you can imagine a streak of geography starting down around Sri Lanka, going up through India, up through Nepal, and then on up to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, all those places, um, that's what South and Central Asian Affairs is. And if you imagine a kind of a west to east uh, string of geography starting about Morocco and then going eastward uh, onto Egypt, through Jordan, onto uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman, that's, that's Near East Asian Affairs, is that kind of streak of uh, geography. So, but again, you might ask yourself, well, what are all these other ones then? And these, the, the term of art for you, we use for this in the Department of State 
are uh, is that these are all functional bureaus. For example, the one that's right before South and Central Asian Affairs there, Population, Refugees, and Migration. Again, the idea is that um, if this is, that's basically uh, the group of, that coordinates our responsibilities in taking in refugees from all around the world. And I assume everybody knows that in the news, Aung San Suu Kyi was in the United States recently, right? You notice that she had a visit to another state. Anybody even notice where she went? Anybody remember where she went? She, she traveled to Indiana, in particular to a town. Anybody know which town she was in? Fort Wayne, Indiana. So why on earth would, uh, would she go to Fort Wayne, Indiana? Well, all the places in the United States. So it happens that Fort Wayne, Indiana is hope, home to one of the largest groups of Burmese refugees in the United States, about 6,000 people who have settled there in Fort Wayne. And this didn't happen by happenstance. So it happens that the people in Fort Wayne, volunteer organizations, they decided they would kind of step up and help out in taking in some Burmese refugees. And that's, and they work, they, that, those local people in that community would work and liaise with the Bureau of Population Refugees and Migration in how that's kind of all sorted out is basically what goes, what goes on. So one of the tasks for, yes, go ahead. Um, for that, sorry, for that bureau in specific, yes. um, what is the role of the establishment of work? The, the intern would do? Yeah. And well, OK. Is it usually like assistant? Well, it, it really depends on that, on that particular office, what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't. So it just depends on the ranges, probably. I, I, the term that when I hear what when I talk to interns about the, the 50 I've been in touch with, kind of you know the expression to get thrown in the deep end. You know, yeah. Well, that's kind of uh, you know. Uh, one of my colleagues who is now is a foreign service officer. She does this kind of work with me now. Uh, she, for example, she did her um, her internship was with our representation to the uh, Organization of American States. So she shows up on the first day. And she's informed that the officer who was supposed to be there, something happened, like there was a family emergency, and that basically her supervisor wasn't there, so she was now going to be our representative to the Organization of American States. So again, I mean, I can't. <laughs> so she, at this point, kind of has a panic attack. But they say, look, you know, you've got a cell phone. This all, we trust you. This will all work out. You know? so, and, and nothing you know, untoward happened. But yeah, basically, we do kind of you. I, one of the, as I say, I asked the different interns to talk, for example, and it's kind of summed up here by Katie. Katie was a person in Mexico here. So it says, if she, this is Katie together with a signed dollar bill. You know, when, uh, when the treasurer of the United States was, was there, she and also Marissa, from so the UM student, they got to go around with the treasurer of the United States and take her to all the meetings and so on. So she was down there, and as I say, you know, writing reports, you know, that got sent back to the president and the State Department and so on. But anyway, uh, but as she says here, not once did she have to make photocopies, fetch coffee, or refill all the supplies. This is not, you know, this is a serious, uh, you know, a serious work that you're doing. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. So it, it, it does vary a lot. Now, on the other hand, um, there's another student, for example, here from Michigan, who wound up going to Guangzhou, China, and she wound up. Uh, working in the, what's called the General Services Office of the consulate there in Guangzhou. And so she wound up doing, uh, like suddenly, you know, she's maybe she's been studying Chinese literature and whatnot when she's here in Michigan. But suddenly she was working with the local employees on cultural heritage issues related to this building they were refurbishing and, you know, and I like, she told me that one of the highlights was bonding with her local employees about how awful some lamps looked and, you know, but again, she's all doing this in Chinese, you know, but again, so in that sense, it's not a bad thing to be sort of prepared to do something a little bit, you know, like, who knew the Department of State had to, you know, take care of properties that was going to refurbish to make sure we respected the cultural heritage and had to pick out lamps and, you know, so again, there might be something that's a little bit, you know, so it's not a bad thing to be able to, when, you, when you talk to the person who, and, and, and what happened, happens, by the way, is that your application goes in uh, by November 2nd. You may, uh, use, you may he well hear um, back by the middle of, you know, December, somebody from, might contact you from that bureau or office, you know, that you had applied for. 
and, and so on. Is this kind of making sense? Um, explain. Yes. So you choose two different bureaus that you want to work with. Yes. Let's say those two bureaus don't necessarily need a person with your qualifications. Right. Another bureau that could use someone like you. They, it can happen. So one example of that happening, just the way it technically happens, for example, I had a student from Case Western Reserve who applied, her, in, her application gets forwarded from Office of Student Programs over to the intern coordinator for that bureau that handles all of Europe. So you're, and then they don't just send it to the, Spain, they send it out to all, all 55 countries in Europe. So, um, so, you know, so, the, so they, uh, they can, you know, take things. So in this case, the student got it suddenly out of the blue, gets a, an email from Italy saying, hey, would you, would you possibly consider coming to Rome instead of Spain? Now, she wound up getting an offer from Spain, too, and then, but she wound up actually choosing Italy. They, uh, Italy, in my experience, has kind of been a little forward-leaning, you know, in term, a little aggressive in terms of getting people. Another interesting case, I was just talking to a student who, uh, I think had applied originally to go overseas to an African country. It didn't work out, and somehow wound up working in the getting an offer from the from the the office in Washington. So it's kind of looked at by that whole bureau, not just like. So I, I'm sure this is making sense. So when you say if you pick France, then you you have to actually when the application comes, when you fill out the application, the question comes what's your first choice? You say the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. Then later on, there's a follow-on question. Oh, did you mean the Washington office that handles that, or did you mean one of these 55 countries? And at that time, you specified France. Can you, yes? Oh, no, you can continue. It's a kind of an unrelated question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just as far as um, cost of uh, travel, right. there, I know there's the two our scholarships for undergraduates for juniors, but those are more for people that are looking to go into That's in a career, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, right. But for yeah. like, cost, like, is there, I mean, I'm sure that something on the website talks about cost of paying for them. For this 10-week this thing? Really, obviously, yeah. Uh, yeah, for the summer. Yeah, uh, so there's actually, uh, especially, for example, the European countries tend to be uh, rather more expensive because the students, uh, people who are doing uh, the program there have to often cover the cost of their own housing. So that adds to the cost. Whereas, for example, these people who went to Mexico City, Mexico City actually provided their housing for them. So it depends on the bureau. Yeah, well, you can if you can kind of the basic concept is you know they've got a huge number of interns going to Paris, like I don't know, 30 or something, or they just don't have enough housing for all of them. Whereas you know places like Suriname, they're so happy to have you that they're gonna you know really you know Suriname's a great country to go to, and uh, and they're very happy to have you, and um, and. It, that's one thing, and there's a, there's a safety factor too. I don't think we think it's a very good idea just to send a bunch of students out onto the street in Mexico City, you know, go find a place to live. Good luck. That's the yes. Um, for traveling abroad, if, um, as far as if you get an internship that goes um, that is stationed in a, in a foreign country, do they pay for your airfare? Or you no. Nope. Pay for all this? Okay. So again, I think, so some people here in Michigan have been lucky that there are resources that you can avail you know, in some cases. But again, by the way, one th reason I'm just wanting to talk about it, you don't have to commit by November 2nd. So I had a student here from Michigan who got accepted, and then you get the notification in January, then you have to get your security clearance. That often take, that takes 60 days usually from the time you get your paperwork in. And then, um, and then, things went forward and finally out of the blue he got a paid internship somewhere else and so he you know he let us know that you know he decided you know that this just money wise it was he was gonna he really wanted to do this but it just he couldn't see going several thousand dollars more into debt and it, for us that's fine you know it, but again if you even want to consider this an option you have to get your application in now but you, as I say we're not, we're not asking you to sign your life away yeah I just wanted to mention for on the topic of funding, you'll see that there's uh, a session in the International Career Pathways on funding, and that's about funding for internships, and that will be a presentation by offices at the University of Michigan that offer funding for our students to do internships as well. And there are a lot of offices that do. Uh, the amount of funding given at this university is in the millions of dollars every year for students to do internships as well. Right. 
Yeah. Uh, what's the most effective way to make the inquiries at a specific bureau if you want information about uh, the type, the, the way the organization works? This is sort of before you were sent out. Yeah. Well, one thing, um, if I could, so, if I could just. Uh, by the way, this little thing, the quick guide here, this is just based on my experience. I actually went ahead and filled out one of these applications myself. And, and it's a good idea, generally speaking, in addition to making your choice, your first and second choice, as I explained in the brochure, you have to write about a 500 page sticks, 500 word statement of interest. A 500 word, sorry, what did I say, 5,000 or something, right? So, so actually 500 words is not that much. So one thing I try to explain on that piece of paper is that it's, this is a very important site to get to know, www.state.gov. And then you can, you, know, you can find out information about the particular bureau. So for example, we had a student here from Michigan who was in physics. And uh, he, um, he wound up going to the Bureau of Diplomatic Security. Basically, as I understand his job, it was sort of like detecting bad stuff you know, that people are trying to get into the embassy, you know, something like that, you know, so something. So, but again, so if you go to here, uh, I, sorry, I was a little fast there. So uh, the key thing here is about state. I explained this on the little piece of paper there. And if you see number, this one down here, alphabetical list of bureaus and offices. So you can click on that and then go, um, and you notice at the very top of the page, it's not alphabetical at all. The reason for that is we're headed by a Secretary of State, so she gets to go first. And then you can see all her deputies and her counselors and her undersecretaries and her special advisors, of which there are many. And then finally you get to the alphabetical list. So again, let's say you wanted to work on human rights, and you're curious what democracy, <coughs> human rights, and labor is. So this is one thing, one way of finding out information. Another way, if you're interested in going overseas, it's a good idea. To, there's this list down here. It says U.S. embassies and other posts. So in the Foreign Service, it's just like the Department of State, like any other career, it has all the special lingo. You know, we have embassies, we have consulates. Sometimes we call them consulate generals. Sometimes we have a, a, a representation to an international organization, like the United Nations. So that's called a mission. And then we sometimes group all these things together and say, hey, where are you posted these days? So we refer to them as posts. You get so kind of post is kind of a generic term that we use for all some for catch-all phrase. So again, if you go here, this is it's not a bad idea. Let's say somebody name a country they're interested in. Lebanon. Lebanon. Okay, I'm not sure we're going to send you to Lebanon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I get another one, maybe? Georgia. Georgia. Okay. Okay. So Georgia, and so if you notice, remember I referred to those uh, geographic. Groupings, and here you see them again with slightly, you know, Africa, the Americas, that's the Western Hemisphere one, East Asia and the Pacific. Finally, we get to Europe, and sure enough, there before Germany, I hope, is Georgia and Tbilisi. With now, so it's not a bad idea if you're thinking of going to Georgia to maybe um, do a little research. And a couple of hints on on kind of decoding a typical embassy website. There's usually material up there that relates to what the embassy is doing, and then there's material that kind of comes out of Washington on policy. <coughs> so, for example, yeah, here's something by Ambassador Norland has made a statement. Uh, but then here, President Obama at the General Assembly. That's probably coming out of Washington. Uh, and his remarks of, and so on. Um, then there's something from Ambassador Kelly about remark response to the address by the Georgian Deputy Minister. And there's some statement on inmates of abuse, some statement on the parliamentary elections. There's a Facebook page, you know, Twitter feed often from an embassy. So it's not a bad thing, in, you know, when somebody calls you up maybe come December and says, oh gosh, I see here, I understand you want, you're at Michigan and you want to come to Georgia, can you tell me a little bit more? So at least you could have, you know, a somewhat informed conversation with them about that. Now if you want to dig a little deeper, there's another thing here. This is like serious bureaucracy here. So you know. So again, um, let me see if I can find this here. Close this one. So also, and I've known a, a few students have done this. They've actually uh, so about state. Where are we at here? So about state, and you go down, and there it says hopefully it'll say more. 
this again. More. So if you go at the very bottom, it says more, and a whole other thing comes up, and one of them is actually a phone book. And you can actually look up in this phone directory, and actually there'll be a, you can actually get into it, actually. And some, uh, some potential participants in this program are actually called up and said, are you, ex do you have any, can I talk to the intern coordinator? I just want to, you know, and just ask some questions I'd like to see. Are you interested in people with my background? You know, is it worth my trouble applying? But like, especially, for example, an undergraduate, a typical question people have actually called up is, are you, you know, do you accept undergraduates as interns in, in your bureau? And then they can maybe give you some feedback. So that's, you know, one thing that you might do. Yes? Are the opportunities for graduate students the same as all these? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, so also for graduate students. If it's okay, I actually have a guest here today. I wanted to say a few words. Uh, say, and he's actually someone who did the program this last summer. I went to Bahrain. And, it's, and uh, I don't know if Brendan, you would be willing to come up and talk a little bit about your experience. So Brendan is studying Arabic here? What do you see? You're, you're majoring in Arabic? Middle Eastern and North African studies. Okay. And uh, maybe you could just explain a little bit about how you picked your bureau. And, uh, and actually, Brendan is a kind of a two-time offender here. He's going to be going back actually for a second internship, uh, a second uh, that'll be this coming spring at the Foreign Service Institute, which is where we train diplomats in, in like Arabic and other languages. So go ahead. Well, I've um, I, I've been studying Arabic since before I got to, to the University of Michigan. I started when I was still in high school, and once I started studying Arabic, I I didn't want to. I didn't want to stop with just the language. I wanted to study the history, politics, culture, religions, you name it, of the Middle East. And that's what I did as an undergrad. That's what I'm doing as a graduate student. And that really informed my, uh, my choice in a uh, uh, bureau. I, I wanted to go someplace where I could put my language skills, my knowledge of the history, and the politics to good use. So I, um, when I was signing up last year, I originally signed up for Egypt because I was in Cairo in January 2011 when the revolution began. There as a student, and I effectively got run out of the country, and I it wasn't quite that bad. But I, I wanted to go back to uh, to Egypt, but I was told I was going to Bahrain. But uh, still good, still Middle East. They still speak Arabic, some of them anyway. Um, and while I was there, uh, I, w I was able to use my uh, my Arabic. One of my first assignments after we, um, one of the first things we did was America Week. And I believe we were the first embassy ever to do something on that scale. It was just a full week dedicated to showcasing different aspects of America and American culture in Bahrain. Uh, and and that, that was a great experience, a lot of really terrific projects and uh, events. But my first project, as soon as we were done with that, was translating documents from the uh, Ministry of Justice from Arabic into English. And as soon as I got done with that, I translated one of Sheikh Haista Qasim's sermons. That, that was a really interesting project. It took me a good oh, three, four days to translate this thing. Um, I like to think I did a good job on it. And um, it's the language he uses is very, very highfalutin, has a lot of religious connotations. Even the local Bahrainis have trouble translating it word for word. And uh, I, I would speak with our FSNs in Arabic from time to time. Or, and even when I spoke in English to them, I would use Arabic terms instead of English. I remember when we had our duck and cover drill, Muhammad yells over to me, hey, Brendan, you know in the event of a real attack, we all die, right? And so I said, well, then we die at our post. We're shuhada, aren't we? He says, no, we just die. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but yes. Brenda, can I jump in? So you chose Egypt, but you wound up in Bahrain, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the problems, you know, when you, when you work with the Department of State, you, you, you always you start speaking the lingo, right? So in this case, uh, Brendan mentioned that he, that he was having this conversation with an FSN. There are Americans working in any embassy or mission or post, but there are also lots of local employees. And the abbreviation for these local employees is either LES or FSN, either Foreign Service Nationals, Nationals of that country, or and so on. So, and a duck and cover basically the situation. Hey, we're all in the embassy here. The Marine who's guarding the embassy puts puts out a buzzer. It's this very annoying sound. 
I can hear it just now. And uh, and so at that point, you're supposed to like you know imagine that somebody's outside with a truck bomb or something, and and we're all supposed to literally get away from the windows. Is the kind of is that about fair instruction? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope this doesn't sound too scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was no, it, it was. We so then now somehow you're are going to be going back to the Foreign Service Institute? Yes. And do you have any idea what you'll do there? Um, not not entirely sure. I, um, I what I what I would like to do. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm applying for PhD programs for next fall. I'd like to start learning Persian in addition to Arabic. So hopefully maybe taking some Persian instruction. So I was looking through a list of the classes that FSI offers, and it's, it's a very very comprehensive list of courses. I mean, it's, it's just fantastic. Uh, they do have some Persian courses, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe maybe get back into Persian. Okay, well, thank you. Any questions for Brendan up him? Yeah. How long? How long do you stay in there? Uh, well, mo uh, internships go for 10 weeks, but my section chief asked me to stay in 11th, so I did. <coughs> in which section, embassy, were you in? I was in the um, uh, political economic section. So the embassy is comprised, you know, you're headed by the ambassador and then it has different sections. So one works on political and economic affairs, one works on public affairs. So I would imagine that, for example, when this America Week happened, the public affairs section was probably very much involved with that too. And then there's obviously a management section of the embassy that kind of runs the, you know, day-to-day -day phase, the electricity, all that kind of thing. Another huge section of the embassy works on consular affairs. That's either helping Americans, which is considered job number one at the Department of State, are working on visa issues, and then uh, that's yeah. So political, economic, management, consular, and public affairs are usually. And then a few people actually work in the regional security office. That's the person, the office that protects the security. It's kind of the overseas equivalent of the diplomatic security offices. Incidentally, there are these opportunities in addition to all these overseas posts. Um, we also have opportunities in Washington, obviously. But in addition, we have quite a few opportunities in about 20 cities around the United States. These are any city where there's a passport office. And again, it's a little tricky figuring this out. Um, but in, uh, I believe it's in the new version of the brochure, it will be explained that you know if you pick consular affairs, that's the helping doing passport work and all that kind of stuff, you have a choice of either working in Washington or one of these 20 offices. So there's actually a passport office here in Detroit, and there's an intern this fall from the area who decided not to go to Washington. It worked out better for him to do an internship right here in Detroit or for what, or many other cities of Seattle, Los Angeles, Chicago. Similarly, there are um, diplomatic security offices in many uh, large cities, including New York City and so on. So if anybody has any particular uh, city that they're interested in, you can, feel, uh, you can feel free to send me an email. I can try to help you figure out you know, where there might be an opportunity. They're usually in diplomatic security is one. Uh, another one is um, consular affairs. And in New York City in particular, there are offices with the U.S. mission to the U.N. There are opportunities with another office we have there known as the Foreign <coughs> Press Center and that works with journalists from all around the world and so on. So these are just a few and far between, but if, if anybody's curious about that, let me know. Okay, thanks. I appreciate you coming. Yes? Um, so, like, can we, like, you keep saying, like, cities and so it depends on what bureau you pick. Like, say you pick two and then they give you a list of domestic and international locations. Yeah, it's like, give me a topic or a city or, like, give me a, can you give me a for instance? Well, for me, for instance, typically I want to work in disability rights. So oh, how I interesting. Know, oh, yeah, right. so I know that's the democracy and human rights and labor. Oh, uh, it depends. It could work on several things. It could be you could actually work in our Bureau of Human Resources, too, because uh, we actually have a very active program, or the Office of Civil Rights, uh, you would be another one. This is more focusing on the rights of Americans who are disabled. So obviously, uh, you know, so we have Foreign Service officers, for example, uh, providing reasonable accommodation for uh, Foreign Service officers. We have Foreign Service officers who aren't cited. Uh, for example, rather have physical or mental disabilities that, uh, that, and this Office of Civil Rights works with them. So I think that, that might be a good fit for you. So I don't know if this makes any sense, but a lot of, you know, I kind of feel that after 26 years, I've sort of earned at least a brown belt in bureaucracy, uh, you know, in terms of trying to, you know, figure this out, you know, where, so if you name a topic, you know, I can probably help you 
give a few hints where you might want to go. Yeah. Well, are there any internship opportunities related to urban development or public transportation? Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I'm not sure about that. You know, so just to explain a little bit. So we usually divide the work of the Department of State is focused more on diplomacy and you know urban development and so on. It's a little bit more of a development issue. So that could be, uh, you know, that could be more something with the U.S. Agency for International Development could be involved with that. It wouldn't be the Department of State, I don't think, offhand. Yes. Internships work out 10 weeks session. Yes. Now, yes. when you get selected, can you talk to your bureau and see if there's a certain 10 weeks that you can do? Like yeah, yeah. In terms of, and it, a lot of it varies on 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 your schedule. So I think in Brendan's case, I think he started like in May, you know, or something. He got a very early start, and he was back and done by like early uh, August 1st. Uh, yeah, August 1st. So and that's with an extra week. So. Uh, it, some one, some of the criteria and can come up uh, is among other things your security clearance. So one of the problems with my job is I kind of get involved with people's lives, you know, and because I kind of encourage people to apply for this thing. So I had a student here from the Ford School who had an internship, and she needed to do this internship for her program, and we were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and finally her security clearance came by came back through at the last moment that allowed her to get it in the 10 weeks, you know. So I was, you can imagine me, I was going, oh my goodness, I you know, encourage a student to apply for this. Speaking of security clearance, if I can just explain what, a little bit what, what that's all about. Basically, um, as I said, you get your notification in the middle of January and then you have to get your fingerprints taken. Usually it's done here out at the Washtenaw Police will do it for you. And then you have to answer, fill in this form electronically. As soon as you get that, material into us, uh, it's usually about 60 days. A couple of things that we recommend. One, number one, is do not apply for a country where you have a lot of family. So if you've got a lot of family in, name the country, you know, France or in Croatia or wherever it is, do not apply for that country. It just makes the security clearance process a lot more difficult. You know, and so, say, this may seem counterintuitive, uh, because you know you know the language or whatever, but it just complicates things. Number two, the primary reason if you are a person who like, you know, ha took out a car loan and then you like crashed the car and then somehow walked away from the from the loan and just said forget about it, I'm not paying it or something. If you have some sort of history of recent, pro you know, behavior somehow related to financial responsibility that looks problematic, this could be a problem. Number two is recent drug use. So we're aware that, for example, use of drugs such as marijuana is fairly widespread. Uh, we generally, as a rule of thumb, before applying for any program have, with the Department of State, it's best to let it go for at least a year. And I actually, I got into an interesting discussion with a student the other day about this. She had been, uh, done OSU, she had been somehow over in Thailand working and she, went over to, uh, to, to Cambodia, somebody, inadvert some, somebody spiked their food uh, with uh, narcotics. So here she was, uh, unintentionally, having ingested all these narcotics. So after I explained what I just explained, she wanted to, you know, everybody else left the room. She wanted to have this chat with me about this situation. So I, I actually I work a lot with the people in diplomatic security who work on these clearances. And um, in this particular case, she, I guess the deal was that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't prevent her from getting security clearance. However, she probably was going to have to explain the situation, like how was it exactly this all happened again? You know. Um, so, again, if so, if anybody wants to have a chat with, with you know, at some point, I can try to if you have any particular questions about this. But that's, does that sort of make sense? You know, so. Okay. Um, well, thanks for listening. You've been very patient. I hope this is made sense. It's, it's, got, it's to say, I just, the reason, the basic, basic reason I want to talk to you is that, again, this is an opportunity. There are lots of opportunities we have, the ones I mentioned, the critical language, that have a little bit longer, but this is one particular timeline. By the way, one other thing is that, as you notice here, Brendan is doing one in the spring. That was not a November deadline for Brendan, this one he's about to do this coming spring. We have this program is available not only in the summertime but also in the fall term and in the spring term. 
The fall term deadline is going to be March 1. The application period uh, begins uh, in sort of uh, late January, I believe. And for the summertime, if I'm not mistaken, the application period began in about May. The deadline was July 1. Uh, one student uh, who is currently a senior here at the Ford School, she uh, applied for this, got an internship in Washington between her, uh, applied as a sophomore, did the first one between her um, uh, sophomore and junior year in the summertime, and then she applied uh, that July to do it again as her July, as her term, as her semester overseas. She then worked with her professors um, in such a way that she was able to write papers and get credit for it. And again, this can sometimes can help some of the financial issues if you can somehow maintain your status as a student. So if anybody has, if at some point I'm going to be around doing this job all the way through next August, at the end of next August. So if anybody at some point decides that that might be something that would fit their calendar, either doing it next fall or the following spring. Uh, and by the way, in her case, you know, normally these internships are full time. She, you know, got the opportunity and then kind of worked with the embassy uh, to, to, so that she could have maybe a day that she would be doing her language study or whatever. And they were, at the end of the day, were very happy about it because they had suddenly a student who was at a university and she helped introduced the embassy to some professors and they organized activities and so it was a kind of a win-win situation for everybody. Okay, you've been very patient, thanks for your time. Uh, if you didn't get, uh, I, I'm sorry I put these out here a little late, these are my name cards. Uh, most of you I think have my email address but feel free to be in touch with me and thank you very much. I'm Jim. Okay, nice to meet you.